Okay, everybody can see my page okay. Perfect. All right, so we are going to jump into the quantum physics and spirituality class. All right, so this training was created so that you can see the direct link between spirituality and quantum physics. That is the goal of this whole thing. Theoretical quantum physicist Amit Gaswani said, quantum physics thus reveals a basic oneness of the universe. What I love about listening to these scientists talk this way is that it basically breaks the bounds of the classical science that says there is no oneness. We're not connected. It's all chaos. You know, of course, bringing in things like the chaos theory. So I really love that when you really get into quantum physics and mechanics, you find that oneness that's in everything. So I thought I'd go with this quote. If you deeply observe, everything is your teacher. All right. So we're going to talk about 137. In the beginning, there was the word and the word was God and the word, I'm sorry, and the word was with God and the word was God. What if we replace the word with an actual word? What word could be powerful enough to fill that position? Well, the Hebrews knew it. The word was Kabbalah. And there's a reason we're talking about this. So Kabbalah is also known as unseen energy. Okay. And that's very important because quantum mechanics, quantum physics is working with unseen energy. In the beginning, there was the Kabbalah, and the Kabbalah was with God, and the Kabbalah was God. Unseen energy. I'm pretty sure that's probably the best definition you could of, of God. No one has God in the corner, you know, and it's going, there he is right there. So the Kabbalah in Gematria equals the number 137. This was the direct link between all the physics and the Kabbalah, is that in Gematria, you pull it out and you find the numbers 137. Also, when you take the words in the beginning and you take the Gematria, 23, 33, 81, right? Very important numbers. 23 plus 33 plus 81 is 137. All right. We're going to be talking a lot about this 137. The Kabbalah focuses on making the unseen become seen, revolving around the idea of uncovering it and understanding the hidden spiritual aspects of reality that are not immediately apparent to our physical senses. Okay, so this ancient book that most people reject has actually been talking about quantum physics for a very long time. All right, regarding the number 137, it has been a mystery ever since it was discovered more than 50 years ago. And all good theoretical physicists put this number on their wall and they worry about it. It's one of the greatest damn mysteries of physics, a magic number that comes to us with no understanding by man. You might say that the hand of God wrote that number. And we don't know how he pushed his pencil. We know what kind of dance to do experiment, uh, experimentally to measure this number very accurately. But we don't know what kind of dance to do on a computer to make this number come out without putting it in secretly. Okay. And that's Richard Feynman. And if you don't know who Richard Feynman is, he is basically the person, if you're going to learn about quantum physics, to study. Absolutely brilliant, brilliant man. So when you find someone like this using the word God, you know that you're onto something. Because this is not something that normally happens. And the number 137 is actually very profound in this uh, colony because of the understanding that most physicists, most main physicists would put this number on their wall. They would use it as a lock to their briefcases. They would uh, find locations. They would stay in hotels with the number 137. They loved this number, and yet it also haunted them. There are actually three physicists who died in rooms 137, whether it be a hotel, a home address, or a hospital room. So it's got a lot of energy to it as well, okay? So this brings us to the fine structure constant. Um, I'm gonna be using a lot of the words that you guys have maybe heard before, but I'm going to explain it with a lot of examples so that when you hear it now, you'll have something to compare to. The fine structure constant or one divided by 137, which represents the moment a particle of light chooses to no longer be unseen, okay? It is symbolized by the alpha symbol. Alpha has a number and it starts with one, three, seven. Those of you who take my classes, you know that the alpha number altogether is one, three, seven, six, four, nine. So that one, three, seven is at the very, very beginning right there. But let's go further. Let's jump into the Bible and see the areas that one, three, seven pops out right in front of you. And we'll start with the ark. So Noah's ark basically is the, the dimensions were given in the book of Genesis, specifically Genesis 6, 15. According to the biblical description, the ark's dimensions were the length, 300 cubits, the width, 50 cubits, the height, 30 cubits. Well, the length, 450 feet, is 137 meters. 
The width, 75 feet, is 22 meters. Those of you that know your Hebrew know that's very important to the alphabet. And the height, 45 feet, is 13.7 meters. So there you see that 137 just popping out at you left and right. There are characters that are in the Bible that are specifically 137 years old when they died. Levi's age. Levi's age is one of the sons of Jacob lived to be 137 years old. Amran's age, the father of Moses, Aaron, and Miram also lived to be 137 years old. Kohath's age, the son of Levi and grandfather of Moses, lived to be 137 years old. These are specifically mentioned in the Bible for a reason. When you dive into the Bible, you realize it is a code book. And therefore, these numbers play a huge role in understanding that code. Abraham's age at the time of Isaac's binding in the book of Genesis, Abraham was 137 years old at the time of the binding. This event is significant moment in the Bible, but it's true revealment is actually the mother and the father because Sarah was 127 years old. And so therefore, when you put a divider between that, you actually reveal some really awesome stuff. One divided by 37 is 0 0.027027027. One divided by 27 is 0 0.037037037. They're mirrors of each other. And they are the only two numbers that actually do this. Okay. So 37 plus 27 is 64. That is literally the incubator of your life. In other words, the cube of your life. 37 times 27 is 999. I don't have to explain how important that is. Uh, and 37 divided by 27 is 1.37. Okay. So as you could see here, this 37, 27 really matters. And again, these numbers are codes. When you start playing with them, you start to see other alignments outside of just the Bible. One of my favorite ones is the fact that there are 137 women mentioned in the Bible because it's greatest secrets. Uh, I'm sorry, because the greatest secrets you are searching for are unseen. In this world, the greatest thing you're searching for is actually unseen. Throughout history, women have been unseen energy that has made everything possible. All right. So again, that 137 has value. If we look at the Torah and the number 137, and this one is just awesome. The Torah is 304,805 letters and is read from right to left. When you read the number right to left, you get 508,403. Now, if you split them into three different pairs, you get 50, 84, and 0, 3. Well, 50 plus 84 plus 3 is 137. All right. So what about biology and science? Where does 137 play a role in that? Well, it plays a significant role, believe it or not. There are 137 atoms in the human blood cell, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. And speaking of atoms, did you know that there are 137 atoms in chlorophyll? the pigment that is essential to the process of photosynthesis. And what I love about this is when you put them side by side, you see that the real difference between these two is just the center. It's magnesium and it's iron. That is gonna be the difference between the two. And so um, when you're looking at this, you know that sunlight shines through, the uh, photosynthesis is the process of converting that into energy, basically converting it into energy for the plant. And when the sun hits us, it's basically the process of us converting energy into our bodies. So the whole process is basically converting energy, and it starts with that number 137. All right. The age of the universe, when it first began receiving light from stars, is approximately 13.7 billion years old. Now, I know that it says 13.8 in different locations, but the reality is when we start looking between 13.8 and 13.7 is just astronomically beyond anything we can comprehend. So we like to balance things out with things that match other things. And when you do this, when you realize that 13.7 billion years is basically how old it is, you also know that all light that you see, because remember, energy cannot be created nor destroyed nor lost. People leave that part out, cannot be created nor destroyed nor lost. And therefore, 13.7 billion years ago was the first light, which means all light that you actually see is 13.7 billion years old. I just think that's cool. That's like walking by a museum at all times when you see light. All right, the Masons, they knew about this, right? When you actually look at the symbol that they have that represents, there's a lot of information, but the main one I want you to see is right here, okay? So the icon that they have, the distance from here to here is 47 degrees, and you have a 90 degree angle that crosses here. 47 plus 90 is 137. Okay, this number is astronomically important. One of my favorite ones, of course, is gonna be your chakras though, without a doubt. You have your seven chakras that run along your spine, your 33 bones. 
your root chakra, 396 hertz, your sacral, 417 hertz, your solar plexus, 528 hertz, your heart, 639, your throat, 741, your th uh, third eye, 852, your crown, 963 hertz. And when you add those up together, you get 4,536. Divide that by the 33 bones in your spine, you get 137. All right. Time and 137. Okay. Every 400 years, we have exactly 97 leap years. Leap years are simply mile markers. That's what they represent. And so when you study uh, constant velocity, you know that out in space, there are no mile markers. When you're traveling, you're just traveling because it's all just this darkness. And then if you end up seeing stuff, then it considered a mile marker. So 97 leap years, 97 equals 137 because 97 seconds is one minute and 37 seconds. And 97 minutes is one hour and 37 minutes. And 60 times 1.618, which is phi, takes you to 97. All right. I just love stuff like that when it's all aligning. The 97th uh, place, when so when you're looking at phi, which is the 1.618, and it keeps going on forever, when you look at the 97th place, you find a 1. When you look at the 98th place, you find a 3. And when you look at the 99th place, you find a 7. 1, 3, 7 in order. All right. And one of my favorite things is when you're looking at a cube, when you look at a four by four cube, right, which would have a total of 64 squares. When you're looking at this, you can only ever see three sides of a cube. All right. So when you're looking at it, you're going to see this side right here. You're going to see this side and you're going to see this side, but you can't see the back side. There are three other sides that you can't see. And when you individually add these up, you end up with 37 that you can always see, leaving 27 always hidden from your sight. And this is definitely a metaphysical, spiritual understanding, because what it is telling you is it's telling you that the only way you're going to be able to see what's on the other side here is two possibilities. Number one, trust it, right? When you look at your world right now, look at your monitor. Your monitor has a backside, but you can't see it. Our world is actually 2D. We live in the mindset of 3D, which means we create the idea that there's a backside, but without actually getting up and seeing it, it's not proof. Okay, so the same thing with this square. If you want to believe that it's there, that's a great way to live life. Absolutely. Follow that. But you also can get up and change your perspective. And changing your perspective is another way that will bring you full circle to understand things. This is one of the greatest examples of using your third eye. It's not choosing right or left. It's choosing the option that you don't see. It's putting it all together and choosing the one that's most beneficial. And what I absolutely love, of course, is that 37 divided by 27 is 1.37. So the incubator of life is going to reveal the start of life. That's pretty awesome. Okay, so let's get into quantum physics. All right, we've talked about the number 137. Now we're going to jump into quantum physics. Quantum physics is the study of the behavior of matter and energy at the smallest scale. It's a world where particles can be in two places at once and where the very act of observing changes the outcome. Here, the classical laws of physics don't apply and a whole new set of rules comes into play. Quantum physics is discovering another world and it's fun. Okay. All right. So we're going to talk about wave particle duality and each one of these things, I'm going to give you a real life example. Okay. So this is not going to be a metaphysics class. This is going to give you real life examples. Wave particle duality is the concept that particles such as electrons or photons can exhibit both wave-like and particle-like behavior. Depending on how you observe them, they can act as a wave or particles. This dual nature is a fundamental aspect of the quantum physics, and it's one of the most mysterious characteristics that we have. Okay, so this brings us to the double slit experiment. The double slit experiment is a fundamental demonstration where light and matter can display characteristics of both waves and particles. OK, so what I want you to understand is that what we're doing right here, imagine this is light. We're basically firing off photons when the photons go through the slit. If they are a wave, they cross into each other, therefore creating this long line that you see along the wall. OK, but if they go through this slit right here, then basically they come out as like baseballs against the wall. So that's what you're seeing. You're seeing the two different options of what happens in the double slit experiment. Okay? So when particles are sent through two slits, they create an interference pattern as if they were waves, but they also act as particles. And so basically the experiment was to fire photons through two slits from outside of a room. Okay, So they literally left the room, they fired the photons. 
Therefore, they were not observing the experiment until it's complete. When they returned, they saw that it created both patterns on the wall. So basically, you had the wave and the particle. They're like, okay, interesting. But when the observer watched the photons go through the slits, they only acted as either a wave or a particle, as if they are being watched. This experiment challenged our understanding of the nature of reality. This broke the doors open for everything. And the craziest thing is this actually happened in 1909. So when you think of, you know, quantum mechanics and quantum physics, you think, oh, it's all today and it's new. It is not. This stuff has been talked about long before we even had a computer to test these things out. And there is an experiment that you guys can actually do where you can test this out yourself. OK, now you can't actually get a photon gun because a photon gun heats it up so much that it fires off something and we don't want to have house fires. But um, there is something that I will be uploading in an email for you guys, step by step guide where you guys can do a little experiment so you can see the light reflected through both slits that you guys create. All right. OK, so we had to ask ourselves three fundamental questions at this point. Number one, is something as small as a photon truly aware that it's being observed? Okay, and this introduced the decoherence theory. Decoherence occurs when a quantum system interacts with its environment in such a way that the quantum behavior appears to vanish, leaving a classical system behind. So leaving a uh, line, as you can see right here, or an actual like baseball hit. Okay, that's one option. Does the act of creating an observational doorway force the photons to make a choice? OK, so in other words, the act of creating two of these, does it force it to actually make a choice? Well, the Copenhagen interpretation states that the act of measurement collapses the wave function into a definite into a definite state. When one is chosen, the other collapses and is no longer real. So, example, if it goes through this one and chooses this one, this collapses. It goes away. Therefore, that's why all of them would go through this one, therefore creating one option, either the wave or the actual particle. Okay, so that's the Copenhagen interpretation. And if you guys watch uh, Big Bang Theory, it's one of my favorite shows ever, you'll see that each and every episode is actually the name of a scientific theory. So when you watch the episode, you'll see how they're demonstrating in real life these different theories in the way that they interact with each other. It's really awesome. And the final question, is the observer co-creating the outcome? All right, the next question. So this brings into the observer effect. The observer effect is very much like the Copenhagen interpretation, but demonstrates more of a bond with the photon and energy you are observing. In other words, you are co-creating together. There's a process, a bond, okay? Now, here is where it gets really interesting. When the scientists would leave the room, but leave a camera, the photons responded as if they were still being watched only giving outcomes of a wave or a particle, which now steps into spirituality. This brought up new questions. Could the curve of an eye and the way that light reflects off the bend of an eye be the only thing the photon needs to know that it's being observed? And this brings to a greater question. Could this lead to why we believe we are not alone? because the atmosphere on Earth acts as a giant lens that the sunlight shines through, leaving all that are touched by it a deeper sense of knowing they are being observed. Could this lead to the understanding of God? These are great questions that they all started to ask. And so as much as we're talking about science, this also broke doors for philosophy and metaphysical and, and metaphysics. Okay, so again, looking at this, you've got the lens, You've got the eye. If the light shined, it has that curve. Therefore, the photons would think that they're being watched, even though no one is watching them at that time. The same thing with your eye. Your eye has a curve. So when you are observing something, let's go back to that observer, observer effect. When you're observing something, what you are observing suddenly becomes aware you're observing it. Therefore, the more of a bond that you make with it, the more of a connection you'll have, which we'll be going into November 5th when we jump into our aerokinetics class. OK, so the understanding is that the observer doesn't have to be alive. It has to have the curve that the light is looking for. OK. Now, this is going to bring me into the mandala Mandela effect. It wasn't until recently that I realized that the mandala literally teaches you the understanding that everything changes. 
Buddha used to take the monks that wouldn't let go of their issues, wouldn't let go of the things that they wanted to hold on to. And he would have them basically do a mandala. And basically it's sand that you're putting in different places uh, to make this image. And then at the very end, you literally whoosh it away or you put it together uh, in like a jar and you release it naturally into nature, into the water. Either way, the whole point is you put a lot of time into it and you have to understand that everything changes and everything can be let go. So when you look at this, this is where it gets kind of interesting when you're looking at the Mandala and Mandela effect. Okay. Mandala effect, the effect of understanding that everything changes. Mandela effect, the effect of mass consciousness remembering things differently than the way that they are today. Without the ME, you would never know anything changed. Those who are remembering things differently than the way that they are today are actively participating in the double slit experiment. And I'm going to show you that here in a second. But before we get to that, those of you that don't know what the Mandela effect is, I've got some live examples for you. Okay. So when we look at Oreo double stuff, majority of people, and by majority, I'm talking millions. Okay. The understanding is we're not talking about five people are like, no, it used to have one. No, we're talking about millions of people who basically said there used to be two. But now when you buy Oreos, there's one F, double stuff, okay? When you go and you look at Disney movies, everybody seems to remember uh, Tinkerbell going through the castle and then hitting the Disney part. Well, when you watch movies now, no matter how old they are, it doesn't exist anymore, okay? Another fantastic one is Captain Crunch. I love this one because I remember Captain Crunch. I find it fascinating that it's Captain Crunch. Um, and so that's one too, where you have you know millions of people who remember it a certain way. Scooby-Doo, great one. Shaggy had an Adam's apple. In fact, every single time he was scared, he'd swallow it. You'd see it go up and down showing that he was scared. Well, now when you watch the cartoon, nothing. You can't find it anywhere. Curious George, everyone remembers it having a tail. It's kind of odd he doesn't have a tail. And Caitlin brought up a very good point. When you go back and watch these things, look at all the different things that Curious George actually would have done if he had a tail and see whether or not you know it's it's showing that it changed or whether or not it's always been that way. Um, and one of my favorites, because it's probably the most modern, is when you go back and watch the Matrix movie, there is no quote that says, what if I told you? It, it doesn't exist. And so these are things, uh, these are examples of Mandela effects. Okay, so a lot of times when people learn about this, they feel like they're going crazy. They're super defensive over it, you know, as if it not being that way is just going to break you. And that's why I want to talk about this. And that's why I chose to specifically bring this up, because I'm going to show you guys another perspective. The double slit experiment expanded. 2D equals duality, the way it was. Okay, we can talk about spirituality this way. You guys remember the old school sacrifice, follow the Lord, fear the Lord. That's 2D. That's all out of here. Okay, most of us can agree that who we were when these Mandela effect situations happened were less aware than who we are today. Okay, I'd be first to admit that. We watched movies, saw logos, and listened to songs in a rather unaware state. Okay, not completely unaware because no one's ever completely, but more unaware than where we are. 3D is duality plus a third quantum option. Anything between one pole and this pole in duality, you now have the option of a third option. To choose the 3D is to choose to notice the change, the shift, the crack in reality. Those who remember things differently are people who are choosing to go through the 3D. If you do not own the choice, the choice feels forced on you. I run a group. I have 180,000 people in that group. And most of the time they just argue over who's right and who's wrong because they feel like it was forced on them. Instead of looking at it and being like, what if you chose it, right? Now, this is where we're going to get into the, the bigger part of this, okay? I want you to understand this. You are the chooser. You are always the chooser. And everything in life, you're the chooser. And the Kabbalah definitely focuses on getting you to understand that. You are also the observer, okay? You are both in this situation. So basically what is happening is you have 2D, which is a door right here, which is going to give particles. We want to think of particles as unchangeable things. In other words, that's the way it is. It always was Luke, I am your father. There is no changing this in any way, shape or form, okay? The 3D door is waves. Well, what do waves represent? Waves represent change. The ability to go with the flow, get into that water. It's going to shift. It's going to change. And there's nothing wrong with that. And most importantly, when you own that side, you now can find all the areas that have actually changed without being angry, 
It's not being forced on you. You're choosing the doorway. Okay. So therefore your outcome is going to be decisive on which door that you're actually choosing. Okay. So if you end up choosing the 2D, you're collapsing the 3D, which is why people who are fighting against it are fighting because they literally can't see the other door. The people that are choosing the 3D remember the 2D and are getting very frustrated because they're like, wait a minute, this isn't the way that I remember. So the the area that's most important in this is what do you own? Is it being forced on you? Because if it's being forced on you, we could go through all the list. CERN did it when they turned on the uh, large uh, Hadron Collider. Uh, we basically could have jumped into a new one. Maybe we all died in 2012. That's a big one people like to talk about. We just jumped to a whole new reality. We got that one. Um, we also have aliens. Aliens have done it to us. So there's the government's done it. There are all these things where it could happen to you. But what happens if you ask the question, what if I chose this? And that's what I wanted people to see from this. There's another way to look at the Mandela effect as a way to wake you up, as a way to get you to see a difference between the two so that therefore you can realize that everything can change. Everything can change. Okay. All right. So now we're going to get into quantum positions. Okay. And we're going to talk about quantum positions because in quantum physics, there are all these really cool positions that actually allow quantum physics to happen. First and foremost being superposition. Superposition is the principle that particles can exist in multiple states at once. It's like flipping a coin and having it land on both heads and tails simultaneously. Only when you observe one, basically to choose which one you're observing, does it actually choose a state? This is the fundamental concept of quantum physics. And I know that you guys have seen this before because this is my favorite image of, oh, sorry, real quick. Uh, Albert Einstein famously referred to the quantum entanglement as spooky action at a distance. Okay. Schrodinger's cat is one of my favorite things to talk about because it, it puts it all in perspective of understanding this. Schrodinger's cat is a thought experiment that illustrates the paradox of quantum superposition. A cat inside of a box is both alive and dead until observed, mirroring how quantum particles exist in multiple states until measured. In simple terms, if a cat is inside of a box and it has both toxins and natural food inside the box, you will not know if the cat chose the food over the toxin until you open the box and observe it. Okay, so this goes back to the Copenhagen interpretation of the moment you open the box, the two options are no longer two options. You have to choose one by your observation. It's either not doing so well, we need to take it to a vet, or, because I don't like saying dead, or it is uh, basically fine and it chose the food, but you won't know until you lift open the box and find out. Okay, so what's really cool about that is science basically proves that two things can exist at the same time, because if you stand outside that box, it exists, both exist in your reality, you don't know yet. All right. Now, this is going to bring us into quantum entanglement. I apologize, the uh, Albert Einstein was supposed to be before. <laughs> um, so quantum entanglement, when two or more particles become connected in such a way that the state of one instantly influences the state of the other no matter the distance. This has been called spooky action at a distance by Albert Einstein and is the central phenomenon in quantum physics. If you have a red ball and a blue ball and you put one in a box and ship it to China and another in a box and you ship it to the moon, but you did not look at which one was in each box. When you open the box in China and it turns out to be red, you know instantly that the one that you sent to the moon is blue. This is a very simple understanding of that. Now, quantum entanglement goes further than that. It states that if the red ball is bounced by a kid, the blue ball will magically bounce as well as if they are connected over space and time. Okay, so that's just an understanding of quantum entanglement. Quantum tunneling is a little bit different. Quantum tunneling is the phenomenon where particles move through a barrier that should be impenetrable. In other words, you can't get through it, according to our classic physics. It's as if you threw a ball against a wall and it went through the wall instead of bouncing back at you. This concept has applications in modern technology like something like a transistor, which is what I'm gonna show you. A transistor is like a tiny gate that controls the flow of electricity. Sometimes the electricity faces a barrier that it shouldn't be able to cross, much like a wall. According to classical rules, the electrical charge should stop right there. But because of quantum tunneling, it teleports through the barrier and continues on its way, allowing you to act, allowing your devices to function properly. So next time that you're using your phone or your laptop, remember the magic of quantum tunneling is actually happening before your eyes. Okay, it is partially responsible for making it work. 
Now, that is resistors. If you guys remember transistors and resistors, transistors are the exact same thing close to um, your chakras, right? Except for the understanding that they're resistors. So think of your chakras like traffic lights of your body's energy, right? Traffic lights are your body's energy highway. They help guide your life energy along the right path. Sometimes these traffic lights can turn red, meaning that they're blocked or they're closed and your energy can't flow through like it's supposed to. Everyone knows that feeling when you feel like you're blocked and you can't get through a certain point. Now imagine something magical called quantum tunneling. Okay, so imagine this is happening. This is like a super uh, hero power that lets your energy zip right through a red traffic light as if the light wasn't even there. In real life, this could be like having a sudden moment of emotional clarity or a breakthrough in your life. Those of you that have had breakthrough sessions with me, you know what this feels like. It's a moment where it just turns on and suddenly everything you thought before just doesn't hold up anymore. You've moved past that barrier without doing much except for having a simple breakthrough. All right. Quantum computing. So now we've talked about the positions. Now let's talk about what we're actually using for. So we have quantum computing. Quantum computing uses the principle of quantum mechanics to perform calculations at an incredibly fast speeds. Unlike classical computers, they use zeros and ones. Quantum computers use qubits, zero or one or one and zero or any number in between the two that you can literally come up with, which is what makes it quantum. Okay, this allows for parallel processing and powerful computing capabilities. And by powerful, I mean this. In 2019, Google achieved a milestone known as quantum supremacy. If you've heard this before, uh, basically what it means is it means that their quantum computer performed a calculation that would take a classical computer an impractical amount of time to complete. To be specific, thousands of years. Okay thousands of years. Interestingly, the Google team didn't immediately realize that they reached this groundbreaking moment. So they were just watching it going, this is never going to happen. This is never going to happen. This is never going to happen. And then days later, they looked at the data and freaked out because they realized they actually reached that point. Okay. So this delay underscores the complexity of quantum computing, where even the experts need time to fully grasp the implications of their own experiments. Okay, so this moment was amazing. And it's the reason that your computers all changed. It's the reason that your phones are changing is because we're now able to upgrade everything to this new level of, of understanding. Because if you were to take even the most intelligent people from like a major college like Yale, you take 20 of them, you put them in a room and you ask them a question. And let's say that they all spent a thousand years, of course, they don't age, a thousand years trying to figure it out. This quantum computer could do it in a total of 15 seconds. Right. That is the difference between our intelligence and what we reached at that level. Okay. All right. So I'm going to stop there real quick because, again, we don't have that many. So I want to make sure I'm going to go through. If you have any questions thus far, just go ahead, take yourself off mute, ask your question, or type it in chat. Caitlin will read it out. Uh, if you don't have a question, it's about three seconds of silence, and then I'll move on to the next person. All right. We do have one in chat to start. Okay. Um, so this one's from Claudie. It says, how does the particle choose what to collapse? Does it know what the observer wishes to perceive? That's a fantastic question. So that basically is the understanding of all the different uh, theories that have been put out there. We don't actually 100% know. We don't know whether or not it's the observer that is co-creating with the photon, which is then saying, okay, I want you to go through this one and that's why it's going through that one. We don't know whether or not the um photon on itself is going, okay, you're watching me. So I'm going to behave a very specific way and therefore goes, you know, only a wave or only a particle. I think I showed you guys that on Facebook where I showed you how a dog reacts, you know, when you're not there completely different than when you're there doing stuff. Um, and we don't know whether or not the moment that we put two slits, two things that didn't exist in a space before, we actually created a portal of choice, which means that they have to choose one or the other. The doors are changing them not the particles themselves. As if you were to go through a door and turn into Mickey Mouse on the other side, okay? That's literally what we don't know. We have those three options to choose from. And as you study each of those three options, it really depends on what you choose to believe because there's no way to fundamentally prove that. And that's why in aerokinetics, we focus on collaboration and co-creation. All right, great question. Okay, Pat, any questions, comments, or observations? Oh, uh, let me look at pictures. So if you shake your heads at me. 
All right, cool. Uh, let's see here. Actually, I'll just I'll just go through it this way. It's a lot easier. Patty, questions, comments, or observations? Observation. Absolutely. I'm seeing the unseen energy as eternal existence, the divine feminine energy, and then the light um, as the divine masculine energy, the I am. And when those two come together, you have holy matrimony. And now mm-hmm. you're in a super, super position where you're <laughs> like in five, six, seven D and you know you're choosing. And it's like I love that. You imagination, divine imagination. And you're looking at not only two choices, dead or alive, but infinite choices. I love that. That's you awesome. Are collapsing it to be exactly what you as a divine feminine existence chose it to be because your existence in a body coming through the light of i am there was yes. so yeah that's that's how i rock and roll over here and i have just had so many downloads lately all of my downloads have been about how does the invisible existence the pure nothingness step into i am pure light and then differentiate into this i am patty being this character. awesome So, yeah, this is great. I love it. I love how you're articulating this. And I love getting the more detail on the 137. So thank you. Very welcome. Very cool. Can't wait to see the downloads. All right, Tosh, questions, comments, or observations? All righty. Caitlin, questions, comments, or observations? Teresa, questions, comments, or observations? All right. Ray, questions, comments, or observations? Awesome. Louisa, fantastic to see you. Questions, comments, or observations? Thank you. I'm so glad to be back. It's nice to see you Yes. I I was just listening to your last explanation for the question, and I was just wondering, do you think it could be due to magnetism? Like the choice is electric, and then the collaboration, which which results in the outcome, is magnetic, so it follows through? Yes, absolutely. Because that's what I was thinking. That's what came to me. Thank you. Awesome. No problem. I'm like, yes. Yep, Pat. (laughs) Electricity, that's Pat. (laughs) We're going to get Pat to be the new Tesla. <laughs> All right. Techno Spark, questions, comments, or observations? All righty. Kayla, questions, comments, or observations? All right. Paula, questions, comments, or observations? Okay. Claudie, any other questions, comments, or observations? Perfect. And Julius, questions, comments, or observations? Fantastic. All right. We're going to go ahead and uh, roll on. So we're going to talk about nanotechnology because this also plays a major role when you get into quantum physics and quantum mechanics. Okay. So nanotechnology involves manipulating. I don't really like this word. I like collaborating, but you know, we're going to go with the scientific side. Nanotechnology involves manipulating matter at the atomic or molecular scale. Quantum physics plays a vital role in understanding how materials behave at the tiny scale, leading to innovation in fields like medicine, electronics, and energy. And we have had some major, major innovations from this understanding. Okay. So imagine that you have a stone in your hand. If you drop the stone, classical mechanics like gravity will cause the stone to fall to the ground. Okay, but if you had a nano sized stone and you drop it, classical mechanics don't apply at this level. Okay, so the stone might not drop to the ground. It could float. It could vanish or it could even go up. It could ascend. Nanotechnology allows us to explore possibilities we never knew existed before. All right, so I'm going to give you guys a real life example of this. Think about sunscreen. Okay, we all know that it helps protect our skin from the sun and harm from the sun's harmful rays. Now, I'm going off of this saying that there was a point where we believed in this. Okay, Um, clearly, the sun has a lot more to offer and there's a lot more that goes into this and fear definitely sells things. Okay, but (laughs) nanotechnology allowed us to actually get at a level to recreate sunscreen. So scientists have used really, really tiny particles to make the sunscreen go on your skin more smoothly and offer better protection. These tiny particles are so small that they are measured in nanometers. A nanometer is a billionth of a meter. Okay, we are talking teeny tiny. Um, They use them in uh, breathalyzers. Okay, nanotechnology was used in breathalyzers. So basically the understanding is that when you zoom in and zoom in and zoom in and zoom in and zoom in onto a particle of 
what makes up your breath, you couldn't get a full picture of it before if you were just to smell someone's breath, if they had just a little bit past the line of alcohol. But as we used nanotechnology, we were able to get the numbers to align so that basically we expanded a corner of that so massive that if there was just a fraction of alcohol, they would do the math that would calculate that you were past the limit that you were supposed to. So nanotechnology is used all around you in many ways and many innovations as we move forward. Okay. Quantum physics is not just theoretical. Okay, at the core, we use quantum uh, technology in many things, such as smartphones, GPS, and MRI machines. By understanding the behavior of particles at the quantum level, scientists have developed these uh, practical applications that allow us to basically expand in all these areas. All right, quantum and spirit. All right, quantum physics offers explanations for spiritual phenomena such as consciousness. This is something we could never answer before because the oneness didn't exist before. When you go off the Darwin theory, it is that everything is separate and everything basically evolves separately. When you really study animals, you might actually notice that the animals that actually go instinct are actually being re-evolved um, re in other animals. And so you're seeing parts of that. It's all connected together. Okay, It's a field where science meets philosophy, and it invites us to question the nature of our existence. This is the moment that spirituality and science met each other, came together. This is also why I say when you take spirituality and science, you take the two S's, you flip them up, you end up with that infinity sign, right? They are interconnected and they basically are everything, okay? Quantum physics has been linked to the concepts of energy healing and alternative medicine. The idea that everything is connected at a quantum level has been used to explain healing practices that work with the body's energy fields. Okay, whether you're talking about Reiki, whether you're talking about understanding things like telomeres, whether you're talking about understanding your chakras, okay, the whole premises behind all of those things is to understand that everything is connected. Once you can find the connection, you can find the change. Caitlin and I were talking about this the other day, the brain barrier. There's a barrier that is basically in your brain that does not allow any toxins or anything to go into your brain because if it did, <laughs> you'd be dead. So it is the strongest field that you actually have. So the question now is kind of in our mind of what if you learn how to basically recreate create that metaphysically, could you put that in other places of your body, such as your liver, right? If your liver is affected, such as your heart, if your heart is affected to not allow things to cause more damage, but allow it the time to heal. Okay, so these are things that brought up these questions. And as we move into this year and into next year, you are going to see an astronomical an astronomical amount of information on healing because we are now understanding that this whole model that 2d that doesn't work anymore you're not sick or good you're anything in between and when you start observing your life as anything in between you're no longer observing your life as sick all right okay so this is going to bring everything together the nobel prize in 2022 and it's funny because people don't pay attention to this stuff but this is super important Okay, this is going to blow everything out. So John Bell receiving the 2022 Nobel Prize is a big deal for us. It's massive for quantum mechanics and quantum physics. Okay, Quantum mechanics, a key theory in physics, explains tiny particles well. But here's a twist for the math to make sense. Things can't be real. Okay, They can't be real for the math to make sense. Now, that is super confusing, but this also brings the understanding of when you study quantum mechanics, let's say you're looking at a quantum computer. The second you actually observe a quantum computer, the chip, the qubit that's running everything, the whole thing becomes a paperweight. It collapses all its quantum options and literally becomes a paperweight. You can't do anything with it. And if you really want to look into how much money we have blown <laughs> trying to understand this, you'll be absolutely blown away because we have spent over a trillion dollars basically taking a quantum computer and turning it into a paperweight. And if you don't know what a trillion dollars looks like, if you had $20,000 in stacks and you put it on the ground, it'll go all the way to Saturn. Okay. Just to put a, a, an understanding of how much work we have actually put into understanding quantum computers. I feel bad for the first guy who looked at it and didn't know that that was going to happen. All right. So think about falling down. If you fall down and you get back up, you know you fell. You're the one that knew you fell, right? If you're honest, you're the one that fell. But if no one saw it, you absolutely can just start jogging and be like, oh, I meant to do that. And that was just part of the process and you never actually fell, okay? So now imagine you're linked with someone on a faraway moon. If someone sees you fall, it makes your fall real, 
right? You can't lie at that point. If someone sees you fall, it makes it real. And at the same time, the other person's fall real too. Remember quantum entanglement, superposition, it makes their fall real too. It's a strange and exciting idea that shows how everything is connected even when far apart, even when we can't see how far the distance is. And just to add on to that, you guys might be interested, is that this year we actually officially created a robot that is over. So basically they put one on one side of the world and they put the little device on the other side of the world that you wear and everything the robot interacted with, everything it smelled, touched, taste, the person who was over here could actually smell, touch and taste. We have officially been able to replicate that. They won a million dollars for an award to create the robot that now can go out to space and we can actually experience what it's experienced once we master, of course, a connection. But that's coming. <laughs> um, so that's basically what we're talking about. So many people were troubled by the uncertainties of quantum mechanics, including a man named John Stuart Bell. He wondered if beneath the probability of quantum mechanics, there might be a hidden reality, right? So we've got quantum mechanics that we know as soon as we do the math, it can't be real. So we wanted to know, is there something else? Is there something solid underneath there that we basically could tap into? Imagine two realities, each standing alone, like having either one fall or neither fall. Most thought quantum mechanics was only predicting things on an invisible level. You were never going to see it, so it didn't matter, which is why it was cast away in, in uh, 1909 as basically metaphysical. And if you remember, uh, those of you that love Tesla, he basically said, the moment we start studying metaphysical over science, over the physical, over the old school classical, we were going to surpass everything that we knew, everything that we knew. Okay. And that's exactly what ended up happening in 2022. So John devised a way to test this. If nothing was beneath quantum mechanics, the result would lean one way. If a hidden reality existed underneath the math, the results would lean another way. It was an extremely challenging test. Okay, It took a very long time of running this over and over before they collected enough data to be able to present this uh, and win the award. Every Bell test conducted, every single one, has shown that there are no hidden elements beneath the mathematical equations, meaning that at a quantum level, nothing is real until it's observed. Okay, this is why in aerokinetics, I teach you guys observation is activation. There is nothing else that matters. You can't be in your room trying to change something outside of your house. You need to observe it. It is very important that you observe it because your observation is what activates your surroundings. Okay. And if you don't understand that, close your eyes right now and you'll realize you cannot prove to me that these things in your room exist if you don't open your eyes. Right. You can remember them. Let's go back to the Mandela effect. You can remember them. But if someone went behind you, uh, Patty, and remove that thing off your wall, I know that that is your uh, vision board. Remove your vision board. You couldn't verify whether it was removed or not. And that's the amazing thing of understanding this. Nothing is real until it is observed. And the craziest part about it is we keep arguing over our observations. It's only real for you, right? It is, yes, exactly. It is only real for you. There is no point of arguing. If you're observing it and you are seeing it, then fantastic. Go with it, study it, understand it. If someone else has not seen it, that is completely okay because I guarantee you they're seeing something else they're trying to figure out. It is only when we bring our unity together, when we say, okay, I saw this or I'm experiencing this, do we actually come together and see how we can work together? Which is now going to bring me to the ultimate of nine vibes. This connects with Nikola Tesla saying, if you only knew the magnificence of three, six, and nine, you would have a key to the universe. Because when you get down to the core numbers, when you get to the math, when you get to the digital roots, when you get to the gematria, everyone knows three, six, and nine are the keys. They're the binding force of quantum mechanics. They are the fabric of reality that cross stitches to keep reality together. And when you study vortex math, those of you guys that watched my video, you saw this. You saw that when you looked at the power grid, all the numbers that are one, two, four, eight, seven, five are in their own little box because you're generating light. That's what you see. That's what you're living with. You're generating light. When you want to change energy, you get into that three, six, and nine, all right? And that's all that you're doing. You're ebb and flowing between light and energy, light and energy. And the only question you really have to ask yourself is how bright is your light or how dim is it? The dimmer the light, the darker, the scarier, the more fear, the brighter the light. 
the more love, the more clarity, the more understanding. 